we have from Salem State University, uh, Professor Avi Chomsky, a name that I'm sure is very familiar to many of you. She is the coordinator of the Latin American, Latino and Caribbean studies at Salem State University. She has written extensively on Latin America, particularly Colombia, Cuba, and has a brand new book out in uh, just April of this year on Central America. She's also, oh, she's holding it up, that's great. Uh, she's also written extensively on labor issues, global labor issues, migration and for social movements. And interestingly enough, she got started in all of that by her early experiences working with the United Farm Workers, which was something I had not known. Thanks very much for being with us and starting us off, Avi. Thank you so much, Sunny, for the introduction. And um, to all of the people who worked organizing this today, thank you. And to all of you who are here. And thank you, Sunny, especially for introducing the concept of settler colonialism, because you took the words right out of my mouth. That's where I was going to begin. Um, and so you set us off on the right track. So in order to talk about the history of US relations with Central America, I think we need to go a little bit into our understanding of US history and the role of colonialism and settler colonialism in US history, because I think it's really key to understanding the long-term US involvement in Central America. So I'm gonna start out with the United States just for a moment. I'm gonna do all this in 15 minutes, I promised. Um, but to ask us to rethink the way we think about US history, which is going to help us understand the US and Central America. So I think most of us are taught that there were some European colonists. We don't call them colonizers when we talk about US history, but we should call them colonizers. Um, so the traditional version says there were some US colonists who then turned against colonialism and fought a war to liberate their country from colonialism against the British and founded the United States as a country of by and for the people where they valued freedom and all of those things. Um, but I, we need to turn that on, our, on its head and say that they were not colonists, they were colonizers. Um, and that when they fought for independence from Britain, it was not to end colonialism, but to be the protagonists of their own colonial project. Um, that is, they fought for independence, not um, the people who fought for independence were not actually the colonized Native Americans, African Americans, they were the colonizers who fought for independence. They were the British who came to call themselves Americans, but they were the colonizers. They were the people who were enslaving Africans. They were the people who were dispossessing and appropriating native land. Those were the people who fought for independence in order to found a white settler colonial state based on enslavement and dispossession and genocide of people of color. It was a state founded on an ideology of white supremacy. So I wanted to begin with that because it helps us to understand that long history of the United States as a colonial power, which we could say started in 1608 or certainly started in 1776. If you look at the, um, the region controlled by the white colonizers in 1776, it was only a very small part of what is today the United States. The entire century after independence was devoted to expanding the colonizing project, expanding white settler colonialism. We have all kinds of um, euphemisms for it, like manifest destiny and westward expansion, but it was basically colonialism. Um, and in addition to that, um, sponsoring white European immigration to populate with white people this land that was being taken from Native Americans over the course of the 19th century. So Central America comes into this by the middle of the 19th century because Central America um, falls within the purview. Um, it's recently independent. That is Central America also became independent from Spain um, via Mexico and then independent from Mexico in the early 19th century. Um, and Central America was also divided between European oriented elites who shared this colonizing 
project and all of the structural and cultural aspects of it in terms of their relationship with the indigenous populations of those countries and the majority indigenous populations of Central America. Now, for the United States, Central America was an object of colonization and extraction from the beginning of the 19th century. Um, we have the uh, use of, of Central America, the Isthmus, as a crossing point towards California. We have William Walker's invasion recognized by the United States in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and we have sort of Central American elites in the middle who have an anti-colonial attitude towards the United States that's trying to dominate them. And for the United States, Central American elites are kind of suspiciously not quite white enough, even though most of them are the descendants of Europeans, um, but they're not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, and the majority in indigenous populations of Central America and the Central American countries like the United States engaged in state-sponsored um, immigration projects to try to whiten the population and increase the Euro descended population. So we have connections um, and similarities. Uh, so the Central American elites both identify with the United States, but also have uh, the resentment of the colonized as they are treated as colonial subjects by the United States. So this is established by the middle of the 19th century. Now the Central American states that grew in the 19th century, we can call the coffee states organized by foreign of the coffee elites, um, supported in general by uh, the United States. They were highly militarized states um, because like the United States, because their goal was the expropriation, the dispossession of indigenous populations and the coercion of indigenous labor as um, workers on the coffee plantations. On the eastern coast of the United States, of Central America, US companies played that role. That is the United Fruit Company, the most notorious. Um, there were other US-based fruit companies, mostly in Boston and New Orleans, but they ended up mostly being taken over by the, the United Fruit, um, took over large swaths of Central America's eastern coast. So we have a real division between the coffee elites and their US sponsors in the central and western parts of Central America and the uh, directly US controlled banana plantations in the eastern parts of Central America. Both of which rely on settler colonial ideologies, dispossession and coercion of labor of primarily indigenous populations, but increasingly on the Atlantic coast, also Afro-descended populations from the British West Indies. So this is basically the status quo until World War II. Um, and the post-war period bring, and repeated US interventions, including a long US occupation of Nicaragua. And the same pattern is really happening in the Caribbean with long US occupations of Haiti and the Dominican Republic um, to try to make sure that these governments remain under US control. This is basically the status quo until World War II. And World War II shifts certain things. Um, it begins the age of anti-colonial revolution, um, which in some ways begins in Guatemala in 1954, followed by Cuba in 1959, where these uh, elite dominated US sponsored governments are being overthrown by popular rebellion, um, looking for a more equal, a kind of economic development that benefits the population as a whole. Now, to the United States, all of these were understood in Cold War terms. They were accused of communism. Um, this was in some ways a pretext because really uh, they were also a threat to US economic interests, the interests of US investors, that is to shift the resources away from the foreigners and to the populations of these countries. Um, by the 1970s, there were uprisings going on in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, all aimed at trying to overthrow this economic model 
made for US corporations and elites and the militaries that they sponsored. Um, and to really put together a very different kind of country. The Nicaraguan revolution was successful in 1979 and the United States of course is deeply involved throughout the 1980s trying to overthrow the Nicaraguan revolution and crush the revolutionary movements in Guatemala and El Salvador. While the United States was not and the elites were not completely successful, the peace treaties of the 1990s um, in many ways restored the status quo. They made some political changes, but they didn't really make uh, structural economic changes. Much of the peasant population remained dispossessed and landless. And the, the 1990s, the peace treaties really opened the floodgates to the neoliberal economic model that was really a replication of the post-war and the pre-war economic models that is uh, an idea of economic development what President Biden now calls prosperity, um, based on creating conditions to invite foreign investment. Those conditions are things like no unions, there are things like no minimum wage, there are things like no environmental protections, no rights for workers, heavy militarization to put down any popular rebellion that could threaten the, the so-called rights of foreign investors. Um, and the neoliberal onslaught that began in the 1990s, formalized in some ways with the Central America Free Trade Agreement of 2005, brought us the, um, the current incarnation of that extractive economic development model based now on extraction of mining and energy resources. Coffee and bananas are still in the picture, but they've been somewhat displaced. Um, the maquiladorization of Central America, that is the creation of free trade zones and the use of these free trade agreements like CAFTA to um, outsource US manufacturing to Central America. And I can guarantee that almost everybody in this Zoom room is wearing an article of clothing that will say made in Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, if you care to disrobe and look at your labels. Um, tourism, and what they call non-traditional exports, in particular massive plantations of things like African palm. Um, so when President Biden talks about security and prosperity for Central America, which is the title of his plan, um, anybody who knows Central American history knows that security means militarization and prosperity means rights for foreign investors. This is precisely the model that has brought the crisis for the poor that led to the revolutions of the 1970s and 1980s, and that currently with revolutionary hopes crushed is leading to massive out-migration. Thank you. Quite, a, quite a amazing summary, Avi, thank you very much.